Welcome, my friends. We are in Aranda del Duero, a central village in the denomination of origin Ribera del Duero, one of the wines producing areas in Spain with fastest growth in international recognition. The river behind me is the Duero, passing through the middle of the village in its way to the city of Porto in Portugal, where he meets with the Atlantic Ocean. This is a wine river like few others in the world as it gives birth to several well-known wine denominations of origin in two different countries. We will visit several wineries, told to be the culturists and educators, and taste the cuisine of this extremely exciting millenary region. I hope that you enjoy the journey. Rivera del Duero is located in the autonomous community of Castilla y León. Rivera means riverside, hence Rivera del Duero is the Duero's riverside. Indeed, the DO follows the River Duero for more than 100 kilometers from the province of Soria in the east to the province of Valladolid in the west, passing through the provinces of Segovia and Burgos, the latter hosting most of the area under vine of the DO. Wine has been produced in Rivera del Duero for many centuries. The first historical documentation was dated in Roman times, as evidenced by an incredibly well-preserved mosaic of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, found not long ago in the village of Baños de Valdearados in the province of Burgos. But wine as we currently know it was probably introduced in the area by Benedictine monks from Burgundy, France, around the 12th century. One of the striking characteristics of this region is its very unique wine architecture. During centuries, wines have been produced in public lagars and matured in subterranean cellars owned by individual families in almost every village in the region. But let's learn about these characteristics from the locals. Here with uh, Nacho Rincón, who is a viticulturist of uh, Rivera del Duero. Nacho, a pleasure to talk to you. Can you tell us a little about the project that you have developed here, the restoration? Yes, this is a mountain, uh, Cotarro, as we call it here, where there are 160 subterranean cellars. I guess that it was around 1700 when they started to dig the caves and elaborate here the wine. After many years of abandonment, because now most of the people do not do the winemaking inside the subterranean cellars, they started to degrade, and we launched the project to make people aware and protect the place, create a law to restore them, and then open them for enotourism purposes. Well, you will see it from the aerial view. What has happened here in the last years has just been spectacular. You had the site recognized by the European community, right? Yes, it's a recognition an award by the European Commission for the Protection of Wine Heritage. It's a singular heritage that has been created during generations and a recognition that makes us all very proud. We 
are with uh, Jorge and Hernán Arandilla, who are the owners of uh, Bodega Tres Piedras here in Fuentesen in Rivera del Duero. And uh, they're going to explain us how the whole process of um, elaborating wine from after the harvest uh, all the way into where they put the wine down into these subterranean cellars uh, happens. Hi, how are you? Hello. Hello. Let's see, this is a lagar, the entrance of the grapes to the lagar. How did it work? This is the place where the carts pulled by animals brought the wicker baskets used to carry the grapes. The cart was placed here and the baskets, with approximately 90 kilograms of grapes, were thrown through this door. In the lajar inside, there is a main pit where the grapes from all users were mixed. Approximately a total of 3,000 or 4,000 kilograms of grapes. Then that was when the grapes were food treated. They were stomped, people took shoes off and pants off. They were stomped so that the must would leave the pit from a pipe at the bottom, where it passed to another pit where the liquid was collected. Esteban is going to show us how the lagar works. This is how they used to do wine in this region. It's really spectacular. The grapes get in from the vineyard, brought here in carts, in animal carts. They carried the baskets, which were introduced through that window, which is called portejón. Then they threw the grapes here, from the baskets, into the pit, which is called caja, box. Here it was foot treated, and the must was being gently extracted. Then, well, these woods had to be used. It arrives time that you can extract more. Yes, a time arrives when a solid grape paste forms and you cannot extract more liquid by foot. When the foot press must was taken, the woods were placed in the back forming a castle. Then playing with the beam screwing it, first they left the beam and the wood structure was placed underneath. Then they placed the marana, the last wood placed between the beam and the wood castle. Then you turn this the other way to make the beam going down to start applying pressure until a moment arrives when this heavy stone starts to raise. The stone, as you screw it, raises above the floor and then it stays working, applying pressure. Two persons are needed. I'll help you. Well, so you keep turning it. As you turn, it goes, pressing the grape. So as we turn, it increases pressure. Yes, we are already pressing it. It starts raising. Record. Record now if you want, how the stone raises. You continue turning slowly. Just because it's not easy. Yes, continue turning, continue. Oh, you can leave it here if you want. Uh, now you can see it well. And then it stays here, right? Then you keep turning and the stone can be lifted as much as you want. The more you lift it, the longer it takes to get down. Then imagine all the tons of pressure on the grape paste. It was left working overnight. The next morning, the stone had gone down and extracted more liquid. What had to be done? Loosing the stone. Take the wood castle out and work the grape paste. Take the paste from the sides. Cutting the cake, as we call it. And you make a cake cutting from the sides and moving it on top, building the wood castle and press again by lifting the stone in the same way. After the pressing, the must was placed inside the skin of a small goat that was sewn so that they were sealed and were filled with must. The wine was carried down the subterranean cellars. The cellar that we're going to visit now, correct? And these were the pellejas. All right, let's go to see a cellar. Well, so this is the cellar, right? How does it work? Because it is scary by only looking at it. The pellejos coming from the lagar were carried down to the cellar through these stairs. 
Now, when we get inside, we will see a small room that was called counter, as it was used to count the number of pellejos that were put in to know how many liters each family have brought into the cellar. These cellars were made starting in the 16th and 17th centuries. That's it, since the 16th century. There was no electricity then, no heating, no air conditioning, nothing. Are they very deep? How deep they are? We have calculated approximately 17 meters of depth. The interesting thing is that the cellars maintain a low and stable temperature and a stable humidity as well. These are three crucial aspects to properly conserve wine. You're maintaining them as they have always been. You have not even installed a handrail and there is no electricity. How did you see inside? With candles. We place candles down the stairs and down there. To show it, we place candles on top of the barrels. Which is how it was done in the past, right? With the candles helping in case you run out of oxygen from fermentation, to avoid lying inside forever. Yes, if you saw the candle going out, it was time to leave. A curiosity of these constructions is that due to the humidity underground, it is very important to have a constant flow of air through the cellar. And how do you achieve this? There was no electrical mechanism to achieve this. What was done was to build a chimney that goes from the outside all the way down to the cellar. And the cellar door has openings allowing the air to get in, move down the stairs and leave from this chimney and these holes here. This air is in constant movement and takes the humidity out of the cellar. This is why these constructions have survived. We are with Alberto Tobes, who is the director of experimentation uh, here in the Regulatory Council of Rivera del Duero. Alberto, Alberto, thanks for receiving me. Glad to receive you here in our home. Here the climate is very specific, it is very extreme, very cold in winter, very dry. This would help as it decreases the disease pressure. There are many denominations in Spain, for example I have Penedes in mind, who want to become ecologic, which is perhaps, as you were telling me before, what the wineries here are already doing by their own initiative. What is the plan the Council has on these regards, if you have any? Perhaps it's not even necessary. No, here it is not necessary. We have an average rainfall level of 397 litres per year. We are in a semi-arid climate. Precipitation and humidity are always very low, which makes that fungal diseases, the main disease challenge for the grapes, are barely present. Low rainfall is irrigation permitted? Yes, it is allowed, but if you have been in the area, you may have seen that there is basically no irrigation, and people do not usually irrigate, because the young vineyard can be watered until it establishes itself. But it is not usually done because it makes it very easy for the vine. The vine does not develop the root system properly. For the old vine, we are lucky to have very deep soils, and although it does not rain much, the plant is capable of absorbing water at very low phreatic levels, aside of having very low production levels. In summary, our vegetative development is low and the plant tends to consume less water and the maturation is more intense. The grapes, what are the allowable ones? Tempranillo is king here, but you have others. Yes, Tempranillo, which for us is Tinta Fina or Tinta del País. But it's basically the Tempranillo variety. It's our main variety. It accounts for 96.5% of our vineyard coverage. We have another autochthonous variety, in this case a white grape which since two years ago, we can elaborate white wines under this denomination. And that before, it was used in very small quantities for red and rosé wines. It's the Albillo Mayor. And then we have another four, Cabernet, Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot and Garnacha Tinta. In this section, we will cover characteristics of the climate, geology and soils of Rivera del Duero that strongly mark the character of the vines produced in this area. We are with uh, David Ayala, who is the uh, technical director of Pinea Wines. 
I was going to ask you about the climate. The climate here, aside of being continental and extreme, rain concentrates in the winter mainly. Well, winter and spring. Between those two seasons is the highest rain level. Summer is pretty dry, and in autumn, well, it also rains, but definitely less. Rivera del Duero, Burgos, Valladolid are the coldest areas in Spain. How such a extreme climate, so cold in winter, with freezing temperatures many days, affects the wine here, the Tempranillo? What are the characteristics? The cold is important, but even more important, because there are many cold places in the world, is the diurnal range, which is the difference in temperature between day and night. In winter and in summer, as well as in spring. That can oscillate up to 20 degrees. Yes, there can be 20 degrees of difference between day and night. That retains the acidity. Yes. And a longer maturation. Correct. It helps retain freshness and acidity because there's all the heat and the excess energy during the day through photosynthesis when it is too hot. Then during the night, the plant recovers, making the vineyard provide a larger quantity of polyphenols and concentration to the grapes. And it is reflected in the glass. Ribera del Duero is located in the northern plateau of the Iberian Peninsula, an extended area with different exposures and elevations up to 800 meters with respect to sea level. It is a sedimentary valley with a series of geological layers exposed from the continuous erosion by the river Duero, leading to a high complexity of soil compositions across the deal. Soils differentiate from uh, moving down the river, predominantly red sandy silk and clay, like this one, uh, with the concentration of sand increasing towards the west. Uh, let's see what the viticulturists have to say about Rivera soils. This is a flat area, but in reality it's corrugated, not that flat. I assume that the aspects here, with the vineyards in a place so cold, you have it facing the sun, you get more heat than otherwise. Is this important here? Yes, it is very important. We look for two things here. First, we have a river nearby. It is the Duero, and in this location, and affluent which is the Riaza. This is the lower altitude. Then we have the higher area of the Paramo. We look for terrains in the middle of the hill between the lower and higher areas and that the hill is facing south or southeast because when the sun rotates, it irradiates more. It distributes the sun's irradiation much better and during the hours of exposition. It gets more light. In addition, in the middle of the hill, the soil will be more superficial. Correct. We look for poor soils for a quality vineyard. For quality vineyards, it is not of interest to have soils where you can plant crops like potatoes or beetroot. Those are the ones that you find in the lower areas in the valleys. This is a soil that we had not seen before around here. It is a soil covered with the stones. This helps in maturation, right? These are rolling stones we call guijarros. It is very peculiar. People visiting from other places in the world are very surprised. Many ask me and think that it is something I have done to the vineyard, that I have put it in there. But these are alluvial soils, deposits from rivers that were here many centuries ago. Right, and the best thing is that two meters underneath, we have a layer of clay that retains the water very well. This works very well when there is drought because the subsoil stores water very effectively. We do not irrigate in this area. How this the first layer? It can reach two or two and a half meters. These young vineyards have some trouble arriving there, but the old vines with deep roots in very difficult months with lack of water, those vineyards look as if they've been irrigated. They behave very well. The aurora is gentle, but with some smooth variations of aspects. It's the altitude that marks particularly this area. This makes working in these vineyards easier than in other areas with larger inclinations, such as in Priorat or Moselle in Germany. 
Yes, the orography is basically flat, with only small irregularities, and it is easy to work. The soil, this is clay. It is easy to see how it can be broken completely. How deep it is? Is it very deep? This vineyard is clay, as you can see, but the depth is not very high in agricultural soils. The first layer is around 50 centimeters. We can see over there that we have a small vertical cut, and you can see that the subsolid is a limestone mother rock, which is what provides personality to the Ribera del Duero. Well, we are with uh, Pablo Calleja, who is a family owner of uh, Bodegas Honorato Calleja. Peculiar about this winery is the fact that it's actually not within the limits of the denomination of origin Ribera del Duero, although they have vineyards inside, but they follow the same approaches, and we're very interested to know about them because they're in, in a place that is to the west end of the Ribera del Duero, and, and this is slightly different than the east end, and it's just nice to see how things are done here. Pablo, thank you very much for receiving us. It's a pleasure. This is a vineyard that's really inside the valley, which is inside another valley, parallel to the main valley, the Esqueva Valley. What characterizes this vineyard is that it is very protected by the geography, by the pine trees that we have over there, and with a small hill facing southeast. With the frost that we can get here, we always have a problem that is important during the spring in the whole Ribera del Duero. In all this area, this makes that the fog that forms here, and that is very important during frosts, falls downhill and dissipates better than in a plateau area. Where it would stay static, this fact protects us a little better. Soils are clay, and you were telling me that they have some sand as well, that filtrates water until it arrives to the subsoil. Well, this is like this in this particular vineyard. Not all vineyards here in the Esqueva Valley are this particular way. We have come to this because it's very singular and very different to what is more common around this area. We have a soil texture with a substantial presence of sand in comparison to other terrains here. Not as much sand as in Toro Dio, obviously, but we have a mix of clay with a texture of sand in the soil. And in the subsoil, we have a mix of clay with limestone. This means that when it rains, we can avoid problems in the roots of the plants, because the soil filtrates very well. But the limestone clay subsoil retains water, which is very important for the vineyard. And the limestone is that white soil that you can see in many terrains around here. Ribera del Duero is not particularly close to any major capital of Spain. The abandonment of rural areas in the last part of the 20th century had a strong impact on grape growing, as many vineyards had to be abandoned due to the lack of qualified labor. Although things have improved in recent times, this is still a problem in the region, with just a scarce number of young viticulturists present to warranty the bright future that this region has to offer. We had visited the Enology School San Gabriel, where they train the next generation of viticulturists and winemakers of Rivera del Duero. We are with uh, Javier Diez and Yasmina Martinez, they're the director and chief of studies of um, uh, San Gabriel Enology School here in uh, close to Aranda del Duero. And we're going to be talking with them about how do they train the future generation of viticulturists and winemakers in this zone. Javier, Jasmina, thanks for receiving us. Thanks to you. As you say, we started this initiative to train professionals of wine and viticulture with the clear objective to support the business texture, 
the winery and keep our talent. To train in this Vini viticultural region and, in summary, generate progress. In the second half of the 20th century, there was an exodus from the rural areas to the metropolis. I assume this affected viticulture substantially. This idea, this period is about retaining the youth so that they stay here for the future generations to be able to cope with the sustained growth here. Yes, it was an exodus. Indeed, most of the hand labor came from the outside. We have also have students coming from other regions. Currently, with our academic offerings, we even have students from other countries. We have advanced pre-grade courses in Vinci culture, both presential and distance modulators, intermediate grade in olive oil from wine, presential only, but we also have post-grade university level program in collaboration with the Unisted a Distancia de Madrid, which is 100% online. These have opened the doors to a complete formation in enology. Fantastic. And this is not only theory, but also hand-on activities. We can see your vineyards, Yes, it is a question of training students to be prepared for the companies, for the wineries, all enterprises in Ribera del Duero and in Castilla y León. They even ask for our students from outside of our province and our autonomous community to train them in the best possible way for them to stay, come back, to retain our talent and create jobs and generate development, cultural, social and economic. Thanks to you. The gentle orography around the river in Ribera del Duero and the sedimentary nature of its terrains translate to vineyards located in areas with easy access and relatively easy to mechanize. The arid nature of the region also presents a low disease pressure and the elevated hours of sunlight across the year provide sufficient energy for successful growth of the vine. Still, the challenge for the viticulturist of Ribera del Duero is the climate. Short hot summers and extremely cold winters with drastic, sometimes unexpected changes in temperature across the season. You mentioned cover crops, not here, but you use them often in your vineyards. Yes, this is a case that we are studying now. We are in a transition phase. In the future we could leave the crop grow or not. It depends on how we see it. In other vineyards we do work with cover crops. We work particularly with spontaneous cover crops. We think that it's interesting. If we are talking about terroir and a real biodiversity in a vineyard, the spontaneous is natural. Therefore, we will work it such that they grow spontaneously. But spontaneous does not mean that the vineyard is going to be dirty or that the vineyard is going to grow wild. In the end, it gets incorporated into the soil, right? Yes, we always work the cover crop. We plough it depending on the moment in the year. Always looking for the right moment for the cover to be alive and at other times we will cut it short or let it die. For example, in August, in the maturation stage, we will work it to almost eliminate it completely. We let it die. Why? To avoid competition to the vineyard, but also because nights are still very cold. And it's not rare to have frosts during that time, sometimes 15 days before harvest. In that case, if you have the cover crop dead, you can retain more heat during the cold times. We will have less loss of heat by transpiration of the plants. If the cover crops are tall and fully alive, the soil will lose heat through the plant and create a higher risk for the vine. 
Uruguayner is characterized by an artisan approach. Traditional, not artisan, traditional. We try to recover the original viticulture, a viticulture of respect, natural, where we don't use herbicides or pesticides, where all is made manually, because we want people to know the vineyard, to care for it, and to know when something is wrong and to be alert. There is little mechanization. We want all the fertilizers in the vineyard to be natural, to come from the vineyard itself, leftovers from pruning, buried cover crops, fertilizers coming from animal manure, from sheep and cows. You can smell it from here. Moreover, this helps the economy of the region. It maintains sheep herding, for example, and a series of activities that we are losing, leading to the depopulation of the area. Right, because here everything goes slower. As you said, Tempranillo is the queen grape. Here in Ribera, above all, what we look for is quality. We have restrictions. We can only produce 7,000 kilograms per hectare. In June, we do the green harvest. You can see the branches here. We clean all to leave only those two branches. Very good cleaning. After the green harvest, we also clean the whole plant. We get rid of the suckers, so that in the plant the nutrients get only there where we want them. We also get rid of leaves and some new buds. All these little buds coming out of the main branches, below the steel wire. We do this to ensure that all from the area below the steel wire is open and clean. With this, you gain exposition for the grapes to get more sunlight, mature more and prevent diseases. This is a paramo and is all very open and windy. Therefore, all the work done during the summer is done to limit the crop. We can eliminate up to 40% of the crop. In this vineyard, we produce 5,500 to 6,000 kilograms. So we work hard in summer to obtain a very high quality. The most common in spring is the most um, powdery mildew. This year, for example, we have had lots of issues because we've had many storms, high humidity. Here, our best ally is the wind. Wind makes that in many years, just a single spray of sulfur or two, you don't need more treatments. This is not Galicia or other areas with more humidity. Another big issue lately, diseases of the wood. Many times because the pruning is not properly done. The key is always do what you can do yourself. When you are a small viticulturist, you can and make sure to practice a good pruning making sure that all cuts heal in a healthy way. If you don't have too much of vineyard area, it's easy to take care of it.
The Tempranillo grape, meaning early ripening grape and called Tinta del País here, is the king. Its early ripening ensures harvest before the hard winter hits at the end of the growing season. It has adapted particularly well to this area and developed unique characteristics that differentiate it from those found in other areas of Spain, such as Rioja. In particular, it presents a thick skin which is responsible for very age-worthy wines. This vineyard, how old it is? This one is more than 100 years old. This vineyard is the oldest we have. It comes from our great-grandfather. It is more than 100 years old and it shows the old architecture of the vineyards of the past. This is not done now. Currently, plantings are done in a different way. What was done was a mixture of varieties, primarily Tempranillo Tintofino, the most appreciated Tempranillo here, with Galnacha, Albio, Malvacia, Bobal. It's a blend made in the vineyard. But you do select the Albillo, because you do a monovarietal of Albillo. In this vineyard, we don't. Here we mix everything to make a particular wine. But in the other vineyards, we do harvest the albillo separately, and with it we elaborate a very special white wine. The centenary vine concentrates. It produces less, but concentrates flavors, the sugar, everything. Yes, it is approximately around six or seven times less productive than a normal vine. That's a normal vine in Ribera, which already has a very low production. The product is ridiculous. This, together with the unique clones found in this vineyard, makes the wine very different. Ribera del Duero is responsible for some of the most sought after wines from Spain. It hosts a new generation of viticulturists and winemakers that are pushing wine production to unseen levels of quality and uniqueness. We had the pleasure to meet a very diverse representation of winemakers of Rivera, including small and talented producers and a very recognized cooperative. Let's learn from them about the winemaking practices in the area. We are with uh, Placido Hernando, who is the Vice President of the Cooperativa Santa Ana. Placido, thanks for receiving us. This is a cooperative that has worked for 60 years already, coinciding with that part of the history of Burgos and the Ribera del Duero in particular, where there was a massive exodus of people away from the rural areas. Well, the massive exodus and also the challenge of elaborating wine in the old lagars. One of the things that captures my attention is that in this cooperative the wines are sold at very affordable prices for less than 10 euros. However, you work with centenary vineyards. Yes, but the commercialization is very difficult. It's not the same. We work less and less because we have less and less growers and it is not easy, but the elaboration and commercialization are another thing. I'd like you to explain me what is this. This is the old way, the old way of storing wine. In the old times, the most economical way was to use concrete vats. This is the main opening. The wine gets in from the top and is extracted from here. You take the wine from here, through there is to clean the deposit. What is your base? Mainly Tempranillo? For reds, yes. But this area has a lot of albilio. We are among the wineries who have more albilio in Riberia del Dororo. Indeed, we can reach a production of 200,000 kilograms of albilo in a year. What style do you produce? We have been in other wineries that are starting to use it and they're producing it in contact with the lees for several months in oak barrels, in concrete. 
We have always made the white in a fresh style, a little bit of contact with less. Now that is gaining recognition as carrying the name of Riberia del Dororo, we are starting to elaborate them in wood. But our characteristic style, what we have been doing for a long time, is the young white of the year. And then we have the reds, the whole range characteristic of Riberia young, Robel, Chrysanza, and Reserva. Three wines, based on Tempranillo, two reds and a rosé. Correct. The first grape that enters Pinea is to make a rosé. We harvest it a little earlier to use grapes with a little more freshness, more acidity, which is what drives the character of our rosé. Later, we harvest vineyards of lower altitude, which is with what we elaborate our 17. Then, with our last harvest, we elaborate our grand wine, which is Pinea. We elaborate it entirely in barriques with an open end, bojois of 500 litres. This is a wine with more concentration, more polyphenols and more structure because of the extra ripening. The Pinea, which is your top level wine, fermentation is in barrique. The Rosé, how do you make it? We have it right here. Fermentation occurs in these concrete eggs. The particularity of the eggs is that their ovoidal shapes makes the fine less that we leave in the Rosé to remain in suspension due to a force known as the Coriolis force, produced by the rotation of the earth every 24 hours. This happens while the less undergo autolysis, creating a better structure in the wines. This is very curious. The Coriolis force due to the rotation, is that because of the shape of the egg? Correct. Then aside of this, concrete is a porous material that allows a micro-oxygenation of the wine that rounds it, leading to a more complex wine and not a standard rosé. The 17 we do in stainless steel with Criantha in Barrique. Part of the wine undergoes malolactic in Barrique and part in stainless steel. We separate all the wine by plots of terrain, we taste and then we decide the final blending accordingly. I'm here with Pilar Zapatero, who is the family owner of El Lagar uh, de la Isilla. And it's not just a regular winery, it's actually a very interesting project that encompasses hospitality, cuisine and enology. And we're going to be talking uh, about how do they do wines in, in their family. My grandfather with my father had always produced wine in the subterranean cellar that we have in Aranda di Dinoro, and from there we wanted to the quality to be approved by the regulatory council of Riberia del Dororo, so that the wine of the restaurant was amongst the best of the denomination. We started producing in the cellar from the 15th century around 3,000 bottles and in 1995 we jumped into the next level 
little by little, every year, a little more wine. Until in 2000, we realized that we had to build a winery above ground. What was the main objective to make wine for the customers of the restaurant? Yes and no. My father always liked to make wine. It is his passion. We wanted to have a wine. As you know, in house wine, it is served in a jar. We did not want that. We wanted to serve a Ribeirão del Dororo and with the highest quality possible. Once that, you start producing more and send it to competitions and it wins international awards. And you see that the wine is like then, step by step, we found ourselves making 300,000 bottles, not only for the restaurant, we also sell to national and international markets. Tell us about your albillo. You fermented here in concrete, in clay jars. The albillo variety has been an experiment for the first time. Right now is the queen of Riberia. In our winery, we wanted to give it a character from concrete, egg and clay jar. It's not a homogenous process. A part is made in a barqui, another in egg or clay jar, or damajuna, and we then blend them to achieve a complex quality wine. The Albilio variety is more neutral for what we are accustomed in the area. It is not Verdigio, which we went out to look for because we did not have an aromatic white. In comparison, it was so intense, it made this one even more neutral. We are in your winery, so that you can explain us the fermentation process. However, I am very interested in learning about how you do remontage by gravity, in this so ingenious way. This thing here, we call it IFO, Identified Flying Object. When we elaborate and the grape comes from the field, we destem the fruit. We leave it for a few days in cold maceration. After that, when fermentation starts, we also start with the remontage. And we do this by gravity, because it's gentler and ensures a little more respect. Actually, it respects substantially the grapes. It differs significantly from pump-over methods, as the pump blades and pressure affect the grapes directly. The skins, the seeds, which could provide herbal tones to the wine during the elaboration. And how do you do it? What we do here is to extract the clean liquid. We differentiate from clean and dirty liquid. We only take the clean liquid during fermentation and we fill the deposit completely. We lift it with a crane and place it directly on top of the vat. Then we open it suddenly and it all falls down. Lots of liters, around 800 liters suddenly falling, making all to move and to mix in a homogeneous way very quickly. Apart from a gentle treatment to the grapes, it provides oxygenation for the yeast to ferment properly and get the life they are supposed to get, to avoid issues with fermentation. That's it. Also, the fall from a meter or a meter and a half will provide the means to obtain a little more extraction and concentration, because the skins get moved and agitated and keep losing components to obtain a better extraction. This is a cellar of my grandfather, our home family winery. It is a cellar typical of this area, which is excavated underground, with different openings where the barriques used to lie. Excavated, but I also see a stone. Yes, they're excavated, but because we have a limestone subsoil, they needed to add stones to avoid too high humidity levels. The stones hide the limestone. This is our cemetery of the first commercial vintages here and over there. For example, we have the 2011 Honorato, the first vintage of Honorato. Honorato, this is a reserve, right?
In this section, we present tastings of some very impressive wines from Rivera del Duero that we have had the privilege to try in person with their winemakers. And we will also show you what is perhaps the most characteristic culinary dish of the area, the Cordero Lechal, or baby lamb, which is cooked to absolute tenderness in centenary clay ovens all across the area. So we're going to taste some of her wines. Um, we're, we have an albillo, she's going to explain that. But we have a guest, and this is Melissa Del Campo. It's a wine influencer in the United States. And she's going to join us, she's visiting the area. So uh, thanks for joining us, Melissa. This wine has been catalogued as one of the five best wines in Riberia by Pedro Balestoris, master of wine. He said it was one of the best offers together with Verger, Cilicia and others. Tell me what you think. Pedro is one of the only two masters of wine from Spain. What a colour! This comes from sandy soils, and we're talking about 2018. We made 3,287 bottles that year. It depends on the vineyard. Each year, recording to how production goes, as it varies obviously, as we rely on what it offers us. If we had a frost right before then, or something else, we could have not had production. What year is it? 2018. Is this what you have put in the market right now? Yes, that's it. This is mainly Trabanillo. You can notice that touch of Trabanillo grape. The characteristics of those black fruits, blackberries, it has a lactic note. You can feel the oak as well. Yes, it is very gentle oak from barquets of 300 and 400 litres. Thanks to you. Not only we are going to taste the La Isilla wines, but we are also going to try the Cordero Lechal, which is one of the most characteristic dishes of the province of Burgos, and I would even expand it to the north of Spain. The lamb is prepared in a very natural manner. These are baby lambs of approximately five and a half or six kilograms. It comes cut in four sides, which is why we call it the quarters. We only add water and a little bit of salt. Just water and a drop of lemon. These are the only additions used. Then you place it in the oven for approximately three quarters of an hour. And then you take it out, turn it and cook it, but not finish it. It is taken not fully cooked. We keep it like this and we finish the cooking when someone orders it for dinner. Obviously not everyone comes at the same time. Previously, all needed by the oven is left ready the day before here. The wood, which is always holm oak, is placed in the middle of the oven to burn. When there is no more fire, the embers are moved to one of the sides of the oven. On a side? Now, I am turning them so that they get one on the other side. I don't turn them upside down, just to turn. First they were on that side, now on this one. Wow, it looks fantastic. You see, it basically melts. Melissa, this is Cordero Lechal, that is baby lamb. Okay. It is made all the way down to tenderness. As you can see, as it was broken, it's really, really tender. And now you're going to take a little bit, put it in your plate, okay. try it, and let me know what you think. Okay. okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Tender? Tender, soft, flavorish. All right. Wow. There's a company with a Rivera. Cheers. Cheers.
David, we're here with the rosé finishing its Skianza. Yes, we're going to taste our corda. It's a wine that is in honour to the clarete wine that has traditionally been made in this area during its whole history. Well, we wanted to recognise the wine that in this place has always been the first. However, we elaborate it with much more sophisticated techniques now. It smells from here. Melissa, what do you smell? Everything. Fruit, strawberry, berries. The colour. It's very fresh. It tells you that it will be fresh, elegant. That's what we are looking for. As I said, this is the grape that we harvest first. Therefore, the acidity is what drives it. Acidity is its spine. And it has amplitude, which is provided by the Criantha in wood, in contact with the fine less, with fine lees and batonnage. And then the concrete egg that provides that base, making sure the wood doesn't overpower the wine. It has the power that comes from the barrique. Maribi, you're going to show us a couple of your wines, an albillo and a crianza. Exactly. We start with the white. Like an appetizer. As you can see from the colour, straw lemon, it is from 2020 but the wine is well conserved. It does not show any sign of oxidation or anything to be already a year old. Yes, but we want to express its sweet fruit. It has white flowers. Very fruity, green fruit, pear, lemons, peach, it has this sensation of apple, but not very green, right? Apple, even sweet, right? Yes, it has gained that characteristic, like with a bit of honey. And it translates into the palate, all the fruits developing a little more. Just the apple particularly, mm, it's very good. And a very good acidity, very well balanced. For an appetizer, I believe it is very good. This is La Garulla. Why that name? To the people of Amusquillo, the people of nearby villages call us Carullos. This means... bracket, chaos, party people, and in antique Castilian is seedless grape or ripe fruit and in Asturian means harvest method. It all came very handy. And you have to also add the wily meaning. Yes, also Garullo means wily. It's more for its party people meaning. This is a young wine, right? Exactly, this is a wine 100% Tempranillo. We elaborate it only from vines from here in the Esqueva Valley, basically from small vineyards that every house had for their own wine smells fruit, red fruit and even black. It is very fresh. It's fermented for 20 or 25 days in American oak barriques, simply to get some oak touch, to get this characteristic gentle wood aspect in all our wines. We try to work our wines looking for the freshness of Tempranillo, Everybody talks about the fact that Tempranillo is very good as base, but does not have freshness. They blend it with Graziano and others to complement, right? We are in search of the Tempranillo. In this area, historically, they made Ojo de Gallo, which was a wine a little redder than the classical Clarete. This is recovering that style of wine. 
I can feel it. I find it very unique, with lots of personality. This is definitely not a simple wine. When he mentioned making Ojo de Gallo, that was his idea. I just told him one thing. Let's start slow. Also, this is the wine you started with. No, this is my first wine. Ah, I see. This is your wine. The other two are yours then. This over here carries your name, right? Or not? Right? Here we are to taste the wines. This comes from La Tejera. This is unanimous. Yes, from La Tejera vineyard. This is a wine from a plot. This is from our Grand Cru that we have visited before, which is a plot that's more than 100 years old, with a varietal blend where we find mainly Tintafina, also Garnacha and others. We elaborate it in the most traditional way in barriques of 500 litres made from French oak and with little intervention and we just let the wine to simply express the grapes. I found it fruity, with lots of aromas of all kinds, including red fruit as well. We look for elegance, a gentle touch of wood, very gentle and integrated, with a smooth transition in the mouth that brings back all the aromas and flavours surrounding the vineyard. Thyme, rosemary, almond trees and fruit trees in the surroundings. The visit to Rivera del Duero has been fascinating. It has also been cold, but its impressive wines make one forget about the freezing winter temperatures. This is definitively an area to visit. <laughs>